Good morning. This is January 24th in the year 2000. In continuing our Veterans Oral History Project here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, we have the pleasure this morning of interviewing John T. Coates. Good morning, John. Good morning, Joan. May I ask you a couple of personal questions before we get into the actual military interview? Yes, you may. May I ask your age? I am 74. And your marital status? I am married and have been for 46 years, I think. And your wife's name? Elizabeth. And you have children or grandchildren? I have a daughter and two wonderful, brilliant grandchildren, seven, or almost eight, and almost 11. And where were you born? I was born in Valparaiso, Chile. Why were you, were your fa was your family in Chile? My father was a chemist uh, working for a company out of New Jersey, Bloomfield, New Jersey, where we lived. He traveled extensively and frequently to Central and South America. Um, sometimes was gone for so long a period of time that he took the family with him, or at that particular time took my uh, mother and sister with him, and I was born uh, in in December, what I always thought was the middle of the winter, but down there it's the full summer. And I didn't figure that out till I, <laughs> I was about 70 years old. And how long did you live in Chile? We lived there um, about five years total, so that um, <clears throat> when we first came back to the States to meet my grandmother, I spoke more Spanish than English, which uh, horrified her. She couldn't believe that uh, her children had <laughs> done such a terrible thing down there in South America. Do you still speak Spanish? I do roughly. When I go to places where Spanish is, is spoken, it comes back very quickly. But like um, anything else, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, w did you live in any other areas besides Chile? We lived in Cuba. We lived there several times. Um, I became a teenager in Cuba. And what was that like? Cuba is, um, at that time, was a very simple place that uh, the tourists were beginning to discover. It, it was a very cheap place go to go to. Um, it was under Fulgencio Batista, run by the army. Um, I've, I've looked this up. Castro didn't arrive till uh, 20 years after we left the island. So there was a great deal of unhappiness building up. Um, the Cuban people were certainly ready for Castro when he came in. Do you remember having typical teenage freedoms like you would in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, I went to school there. I went to a British private school in the Vidado which is kind of the Wellesley of Havana. Um, I roller skated a lot, I remember that, that um, I had a little pair of red roller skates and I would go from the Vedado to downtown Havana or along the Malecon, skated on the main monument which is there in uh, front of the Hotel Nacional, long hills in, in parts of uh, Havana and I would start at the top and then realized there's such a thing called gravity. <laughs> Came home with a lot of skin knees. And how long have you lived in Natick? We moved to Natick in 1960. We're in the same house. And we're very un-American. We've never moved. What was Natick like in the 60s? As compared to now? Well, it's far less traffic. I, I, and the, the malls were not there uh, as they are today. You could drive around with having, without having to avoid left turns. Um, Natick today is, as you know, there, there's not a single square foot that's not built on. There were fields and open places uh, when we uh, came here. Um, many fewer people. I think the population was about 10,000 fewer people than it is today. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't considered a, a, um, a hot bedroom community. Natick was not the place to live at the time. It is now because of its proximity to the pike and railroads, but it was just some place we could afford when we moved here. 
And without jumping the gun a bit, were you able to purchase a home because of the GI Bill? No, I had used up, you can do it once on your GI Bill. I had bought a home in Des Moines, Iowa um, for something like $4,000. Um, when we came here, it was just a straight mortgage. Mm -hmm. Tell us about when and why and where you en en entered the military. How old were you? I was 17. I enlisted um, in the late summer of, of 1943. And I, I was living in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and uh, for very trivial uh, reasons, uh, wanted to be a Marine. But beyond the uh, liking the Marines hymn and the thought of these guys had the snappiest uniforms, um, there was a draft on at that time, as, as you may know. And when you got to be 18, you will be drafted into the, into the service. And I dreaded going into the Army. I didn't want to go into the Army. I wanted to be a Marine. I had never given much thought to being in the Navy. I wanted to be a Marine. So f with a very difficult thing for my parents, I had to get papers signed by them to enlist in the Marine Corps at, at 17. And they did this while I was uh, just beginning my th final year, senior year at high school. And I was sworn into the Corps on October 25th, 1943, and called to active service on November 10th, 43, which is the Marine Corps anniversary, as any, any Marine will tell you. So you left school a year early. Yes. Um, I got this notice in the mail to report on the 10th of November. And I had to go down and sign out of Bloomfield High School. And it was, in those days, or, or prior to the war, not many people joined the armed forces. So I don't think I knew anybody in the services before I went in, or maybe a couple of guys from the high school who had gone in. But I, I was not the first, but I was among the first to go. And it required going around to every teacher in the high school and signing out. I've turned in all my books, I've cleaned out my locker, that kind of thing. And it, it was a very surreal experience to stand there and, and feel totally different from the rest of your classmates. One minute you were one of them, and now you were one of these guys that would um, come back occasionally on furlough and stand around uneasily in the cafeteria and tell us, to, for God's sake, stay in school. And, and I was going, and then I went. So none of your, fam your family or friends went with you on any type of a buddy system or anything like that? No. Uh, no, I was totally alone. And having been a world traveler, or certainly having lived in another country, um, were you nervous about going elsewhere other than the Midwest? Um, I'm not sure I follow that question other than um, was I afraid to go to boot camp? Right. Or, yeah, I was. And beyond that, I, I'm. I recall very clearly getting on the train in New York that day with a hundred other guys and um, we were boisterous and singing and that kind of thing. And we got on a train and God, it was going right back to New Jersey <laughs> that I had just left that morning, said goodbye to everybody. And it took me from New York back to Newark, New Jersey, where I had been just hours before. And I thought, well, maybe I could go home just for a few minutes more, that kind of feeling. Uh, apprehension, because we were very now a very quiet bunch of guys on that train, and night was coming. And except for a, tri a trip to Washington, D.C. when I was younger to visit an uncle, I don't think I'd ever, when the sun went down, I went home. And suddenly I'm on this train going south to a place called Paris Island. And I remember that night because we had been given um, 
stationery, a, a little gift package uh, by the Red Cross or somebody like that in New York. And in it was stationery. So we all started writing letters to the girls back home or the families back home. And there were stamps. We hadn't yet gotten the privilege to write free on the envelopes. And we began to throw the letters off the train, uh, addressed to family or, or friends, whatever. And, and I have the visual picture of that, of this train going through the night and these letters um, being scattered on stations and things like that. And that to me was um, a wartime memory because other guys have talked about that, being on trains and this um, feeling that, that they have to communicate with the world that they've left behind. Right away. Instantly, mm. yes. So you went to Paris Island. Yes. What was basic training in boot camp like for you? Do you remember? Yes. Um, there's another Marine in this room as we talk. I think any Marine will tell you that the worst part of it was Paris Island, or if you came from the West Coast, uh, San Diego. Paris Island was a, a unique experience. It's one that transformed you in, in nine weeks from um, a kid, a, a high school dropout as I was, into a Marine, or into the first semblance of being a Marine. Um, think, of, think of it from the viewpoint of the drill instructors, the DIs. They get 72 guys off the train with needing haircuts. They're in baggy civilian clothes um, who many of them can't tell their left foot from their right foot. And these men are responsible for taking these kids and in nine weeks, making them um, less susceptible to being killed quickly than they might have been otherwise. And they do this through a process that it, it takes you maybe 50 or 60 years to fully understand what they did to us there. They fear um, a laying on of hands. They can physically knock you down, punish you but all toward a specific end. And one of these things is to get you to understand that you're part of a team, that you're part of a platoon, you're part of a squad, and you are, you are responsible to that squad for keeping those guys alive as much as yourself. That um, we got grand rifles, and when we first got them, we would drill with them and you'd pull back the bolt, and to make the rifle safe again, you have to reach down in with your thumb and release a spring, and then pull your thumb out because the bolt closes at about the speed of light, and within a week we all had these big blisters on our fingers from being smashed in there. But there's one other thing you have to do after you've gone through that, you have to pull the trigger to clear the weapon. It's cocked now. And after a while, after you go through this experience of clearing the, the thing, you're standing there and you think, did I remember to pull the trigger? And the DI, you're scared to death of these guys. They'd say, all right, pull your triggers. You were supposed to have cleared the weapon. And you figure, well, I won't clear, pull the trigger because they won't know it's me. And then they step into the, the tune and make you pull the triggers and then you are punished by your own squad for having goofed off and multiply that by a series of other things holding out your weapon at arm's length 8.6 pounds until you can't bear to do it and somebody has to be the first one to drop it or just sag under the ground and you you make damn sure you're not that guy and that's that's the way they do it I can remember once they took us out to a place to learn about gas and they issued us gas masks and the th half the platoon went into this little shack and there's a bucket in the middle of it and a corporal comes in and he says, well now what we're going to do is train and put on the mask, hold the bottom of it to make sure it works and you stand there and he said, what I want you to do is breathe with the mask on. 
and then I'm going to ask you to take the masks off and I want you all to stand in this building as long as you can and the last guy out is the hero. So you figure you're going to be the hero and he takes the grenade and puts it into a bucket. He pulls the pin and drops it in and you stand there. This building fills with smoke and then he said, okay, take off your masks and you do and you're assaulted physically by the gas. It slashes into your throat, nose, eyes and any thought that you're going to be the hero, if your mother was standing between you and the door, you would kill her to get her out of the way. And you remember this because it's one of the things that you, th you think for a moment, I'm going to be the hero and the, you think this is totally untenable and they know it is. But you smash your way out of the building and then the rest of the platoon is laughing out there and the only consolation you get out of this is that you know they're going to have to go back into the building and experience this, the same things. How long did you say? Nine weeks for? Yeah, I think it, it was nine weeks. I got out in, uh, I went in in November and I got out sometime in January of uh, early 44. During that period of time, was there any specialized training or anything that you sort of came to the forefront as being better at one thing versus another? Well, in a way, yeah. Uh, I was named first squad leader, but uh, that was a matter of my having served in the New Jersey State Guard. And the, the thing about the being f the first squad leader was when a platoon was marching a along, you could see where you were going. Everybody else is back in the ranks. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed close order drill. I enjoyed the, um, when you get out on the parade ground, um, the DIs at Paris Island have a, a very distinctive uh, cadence call. It's like a yodel, a song, uh, calling cadence all at once. And if there's 40 or 50 platoons on the parade ground at one time, this is very useful because you can hear your particular DI and you know what he's singing. Um, you take tests at Paris Island to determine where you're going to go in the core. And these are very extensive. I think they took a couple of days. You go down and take exams and be um, um, vocal tests with a guy uh, back and forth with instructors. And the results of these you don't hear until you uh, come back from the rifle range. And PI is decided, uh, divided into about half half before you go to the rifle range, then half of it is the rifle range, and then about a week where you come home and get your uniforms and uh, check out. And the rifle range is, um, it's extremely important to the rest of your career in the Corps um, in the sense that um, if you don't do well, you know it and the Corps knows it. And you're supposed to, I think, 268 out of 340. 268 is the failing point, number of points that you get by hitting the target. And we fired for record on uh, New Year's Eve, 1943. We got off the range as it was getting dark. Having been through um, a month of learning how to shoot and shoot well, and also working the butts. When you're not on the line, you're raising and lowering the targets, that kind of thing. But any, any Marine that, no matter how old he is today, he might forget his wife's name, but he'll remember what he shot that day and be either proud of it or, <laughs> or, or not tell you. Then you fall out in a couple of days after that into a big field and they read off lists of names and tell, tell you where you're going to go in the Corps. This is the results of the tests you took. Um, my friend Bob uh, went to telephone school and communications school. I, I was sent to the Marine Air Corps so that for my first base after uh, Paris Island was to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And there, uh, you, it's a transient base where you wait 
until uh, a group of you have gathered there, a hundred or so, to be sent to a, a specific school. And at, at PI, I was told that my test marks were sufficiently good that I could go to any school I chose in the, in the services. And they wanted me to go to um, radio school. I, I don't know why, maybe they needed radio men. And I asked where it was and they said it was in New York City. And I thought, geez, I, I just said goodbye to everybody there. Uh, I'm off to the Corps, goodbye, you know, I'm off to, to the war. And then I come home and go to school in New York. So I, I thought, I, I, I don't want to do that. And then they, they mentioned the, the magic word to me, you'll be able to fly if you go to ordnance school. And I really wanted to fly, so I chose to, uh, chose to go to it. And when I got to Cherry Point, there were two schools, either um, Norman, Oklahoma, or Memphis, Tennessee. And um, you didn't get a choice of those. But I lucked out and I was sent to Memphis uh, talking to guys who had been to Oklahoma later on. I realized I had gotten a better deal. So from there you went to Tennessee. And how long were you in Tennessee? I think, I think school was about three months. It was the very early spring of 1944. Um, and did you have school every day? Yes, from very early in the day to very late at night sometimes 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, we learned to be mechanics, uh, technicians with weapons, uh, weapons that would be used on aircraft, bombs, torpedoes, uh, machine guns, cannons, um, and working with high explosives, um, things that go bump in the night very loudly. Um, Memphis was, was hard work. Um, we didn't get to go into town very often. And there was um, a battalion, I guess, battalion-sized group, 80%. And when you say, excuse me, John, when you yeah. say battalion size, what are we talking in numbers? Oh, this could be uh, three or four hundred men um, made up of platoons. But only about 10% of the, these were Marines. The rest were sailors. And we were matched, 20 of us were matched in with a group of about 20 sailors. So our class was 40 guys, uh, 20 Marines, 20 sailors. And we trained with the sailors, identical work, for the next uh, about three months and got to be uh, very good friends and buddies with these people got to know them all, and wished quite often that we could be together, sent uh, to wherever our ultimate destination would be. But as soon as we got on Memphis, uh, they went their way, and uh, I went back to another base. Do you remember what base that was? That I went to? Mm -hmm. Yes, I went back to Cherry Point again. Mm -hmm. And how long did you stay there? Again, I hung around a couple of weeks. Um, waiting to be matched up with some kind of group. At, at this point, I still had nothing permanent by way of people I was with. I operated as an individual. The first time I went to Cherry Point after um, Paris Island, um, I arrived very late at night, um, coming up to the gates of this big military establishment wondering if anybody was expecting me. Does anybody know I'm here? Um, I'm 18 years old and I don't... I, nobody was holding my hand as they do at PI. Every second of your life is accounted for down there by the drill instructors. Uh, this was not true after you got out. You were on your own. You'd get on trains by yourself. You would get on the airplanes by yourself, whatever. And the second time I arrived at Cherry Point, it was just me waiting for a, a group of men to be sent in squadron size somewhere. Um, I'm trying to think about the time when we were there. Um, there was not much doing. We were building runways, waiting to be used. And the only activity we saw by way of airplanes were uh, transports that were learning to dump parachutists out. 
they would fly over in big V formations and dump dummies or packages out of the planes. Um, did you find yeah. day to day it was monotonous or boring or did you find that it was interesting each day? They made us work all day long so you, you, you didn't get bored. Um, we could have been on liberty, but we did. I didn't have any money. They, very often in the service, you're broke, because when you transfer from base to base, your your payday doesn't catch up with you. They have payday once a month, and if you're on a train somewhere, you miss it. So you might have two or three paydays go by where you don't get anything. I can remember um, very gratefully that some guy loaned me a nickel so that I could. Um, buy a coke because I was there two weeks without any money. You get, of course, fed in the mess halls, but no, no, couldn't go to the PX for anything. And to lend money to somebody in the service means that you're assuming he's not going to get shipped out before the next payday. And I, so far as I know, I still owe that man the nickel. <laughs> <laughs> so then from there, I, where did you go? I was... Um, I flew for the first time in the Corps down to Congaree, South Carolina, which is a marine air station about 15 miles outside of the capital city of Columbia, South Carolina. And it's a, it was a very microcosm of a squadron. There was a single airstrip there, just north-south, with hangars around it and barracks. Um, and all the supply, all the, the whole thing that made up a squadron was there in one small package that you can see. You could s stand in one place and see what makes a, a Marine Corps squadron. Uh, there were the ordnance shacks, there were the mess cooks, there was the, um, all the surface personnel that attended a squadron. Ordnance was very closely associated with it. We were supplying all the ammunition and armaments for these planes. There were the mechanics that took care of them. There were the gas trucks. There was the one single big fire truck that stood there. Uh, there was the medical facilities, the dining halls, that kind of thing. And there were, for the first time, I saw the, this wonderful new plane that the Marine Corps got, the, the F4U Corsairs, which was a gullwing fighter. And that's the kind of plane that we were servicing. There were 15 or 20 of these on the base. And our job was to keep them armed and um, their armaments working perfectly and ammunition supplied to them. And you were there for how long? Something like six months, I think. Um, Did you ever get the sense that how long am I going to be going from base to base before I see any real action? Oh, sure. Um, there, there was no process that, that is a, a line that if you stood in the line, you knew the ultimate end of it was going to be going overseas. Um, you might, some, like some kind of flying Dutchman, go from base to base for the rest of the war uh, as service personnel to squadrons. We hoped that wouldn't happen to us. Um, almost as soon as I arrived there, it, it became the 6th of June, which was D-Day um, in Europe. And we heard about that. And we're, we're interested in that. In, in Paris Island, I, it, I might say that never at any time training uh, uh, to be a Marine was it ever suggested to us that we were going to go to Europe, that we were going to fight Germans. Um, that never came up as a thought. We knew we were going to go to the Pacific and, and fight the Japanese. I was saying that it, it, at the, at the, on the 6th of June, um, we were told that the invasion of Europe had started. Uh, the, that same night, my father went down to Bloomfield High School and, and received my wartime diploma which was issued by the state of New Jersey and he, the, the band played uh, Marines hymn and he got up and accepted my diploma. On the back of it, 
on the front of it it says a graduate of Bloomfield High School, on the back of it it says all the courses I didn't take. So that when I got back I had to look at that and go to counselors and uh, start the process of my education over again. On the 15th of June, uh, just nine days later, the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions went to Saipan and in the invasion of Saipan and I think the casualty rates there were about 6,000 men. When I stood in that field at Paris Island that day and was told that I was going into the Marine Air Corps, most of the other men in my platoon were, were told they were, they were going into the infantry, the Fleet Marine Force. They went to Saipan. Um, so what happened to you in that field that day, as you can see, was very crucial to your uh, longevity or, or what you did during the course of the war. So did you find then that some of those that you befriended during your time in Paris Island had in fact gone and perhaps died? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At, at Congaree too, um, several things happened that brought the war closer to you in, in a sense. The pilots, we would load up the planes in the morning and we'd get up very early and go out down on the flight line and you'd pass this row of 15 or 20 Corsairs all with the engines roaring away, ra waiting for their pilots and the mist in the morning and the, and the sunlight just beginning to come up and the mist blowing back off the propellers and um, I had not read much Shakespeare at this time but uh, in Henry V there's this this business of we brothers um, we happy brothers, we band of brothers, that kind of thing. Had I had re read Shakespeare at that time, that would have pertained. You had a sense of, um, I'm in a very special place at this time. And, and in a continuation of Henry's speech, he speaks of men still abed in England, will wish that they were here. And that's the feeling I had. And I, I think several of the other guys did too that I thought of the, my classmates back in Bloomfield, that they're missing something that I, I thought I'd like to be back there finishing school, but look what they're missing, that to see those planes in the morning, to feel this sense of power and see the, the pilots bringing them back at noontime, we'd sit there and see these specks in the sky materialize. And there are, there are birds and they began to learn how to land on carriers. They'd take big leather strips and put them across their runway and each day they, these strips got closer and closer together until they were 860 feet the size of a, a carrier. Some of these kids got killed um, because uh, mechanical failures, that kind of thing. A plane would burst into flames or something and crash. Were, because they were new, the Corsairs were relatively new at that time. Sometimes their landing gear got stuck. And we would be at the mess hall and we were told some guy's stuck up there. And that meant we would come back and sit in the shade of the hangars and smoke our cigarettes and watch the colonel would go up in his plane like the mother hen and fly with him. And they'd dive down and snap the plane to see if they could get the gear to come down. Sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. So we wait for him to run out of gas and he'd come in and float in and flare out and smash up the plane and sometimes the guys were killed and sometimes they weren't. So that had to have affected a young 18 year old also. Yeah, you, you felt bad for them but you, uh, some side of you felt, well, that's the way it goes. Uh, we, I don't mean to say we're indifferent to this, but there was nothing you could do about it, and you felt very bad about it. But you'd, you'd clean up the planes, and they'd do the whole thing uh, all over again the next day. So from there then, um, which was, you said, Congaree Field? Yes. Where did you go from there? From Congaree, um, I went to Arkansas 
and it was uh, it was terrible. This is the early early um, part of nineteen late part of nineteen forty four and getting into the winter. So you've already been in a year, approximately. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in Arkansas, we really had nothing to do, that we run a base. Um, oh, can I go back a second? You sure can. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to tell you is that we worked, we worked with ammunition and flares and explosives and all, all that kind of stuff at Congaree. And big trains would come in at night, and we would unload them of all these boxes of ammunition that, that weighed 110 pounds apiece, the, the 50 caliber shells. And then we would take them out to the, the ammunition dump and store the things out there, where we had a lot of stuff we had uh, that exploded, that made noises. And one of the things I remember about being out there was um, we unloaded a box of flares for, for very pistols, which were fired up into the air when you're down and to attract attention. And we took the flare apart and laid it all out on the ground with this pile of stuff and powder that was in it. And, and of course, the natural question was, what'll happen if we light it? So one of the guys in the outfit named Meekum, I remember his name, he lit it. And what happened, if anybody ever asks you what will happen if you do this, is it shot up a, a cloud of black smoke and red smoke about the size of an atomic blast. And we knew we were in trouble because within about three minutes we heard sirens and the coming of ambulances and all this kind of thing. And Two fire trucks showed up and a bunch of MPs. They, they thought the ammunition dump was going to explode. And the officer in charge was a warrant officer named Haney, which, who we all liked. And he had been in the Corps so long, we thought he was the first Marine that had ever lived. And he had seen everything, I'm sure. And he looked at this, saw that nothing was wrong, and he said, what happened? And Meekum said, we lit the flare. And he said, who lit the flare? And Meekum said, I lit the flare. We wanted to see what would happen. And Haney looked at him and he said, don't ever do it again. And he got back in his Jeep and drove away. But you can imagine that Haney made a lot of points. I mean, Meekum made a lot of points with us that day because he had fessed up. He had taken responsibility. Yeah. Okay, we're in Arkansas. Arkansas, and you said yeah. it was not good. It's not good. It was winter in Arkansas. Uh, we felt we'd been left out of the war. Um, we had heard by this time that the Navy guys who had been with us in Memphis had been assigned to the carrier Franklin. And we thought, oh, you know, that's the duty, the, the really thing that we wanted to do more than anything else was to be on a carrier. The only thing going on on our base was um, a flock of army planes that were learning to drop parachutists. And they'd fly by at night, and the running lights, green on one side and red on the other, like, was like flying Christmas trees. And we'd go out and watch them and comment on their skills or lack of it. But this was early, almost 1945, so that um, I'm not sure there were any other parachute jumps during the course of the war, maybe, maybe there were, but they were still training for this kind of thing. And we weren't doing anything except moving furniture around and, and loading boxes and things like that. And then finally the word got that we were going to ship out and go west. And by west you mean? To, Cal to California. Mm -hmm. um, we got on a train and, and took us a couple of days to go from Arkansas to California. While we were on that train, this, is, this brings us up to um, late March, the Franklin was bombed off the coast of Japan. 
and suffered extreme casualties. We heard about this and we wondered about the guys that we knew on it. The Franklin was bombed so severely and damaged so severely. I think this is true that of all the American warships in the war, this one was the most damaged that floated, that survived. And it, it started it, its long journey um, back to the States um, a couple of days later after they got the engine started. So it was a crippled carrier. Absolutely. So you're in, on the west coast, still not seeing any what you would consider action. How long were you in California? Just about a week. Um, we went to Miramar, um, the Marine Corps Air Station at Miramar, and we were preparing to go overseas. We got lectures and um, got our rifles back, which had been taken away from us um, after Memphis and after Paris Island. We were issued our armament, then, then it was taken away. Um, we got that back. We got a load of stuff to, to carry on. And on the first day of April in 1945, Robert Dunbar was going ashore at Okinawa. And, and Robert Dunbar is a friend of yours. Yes, he's a friend of mine mm -hmm. I, that I met here in Natick uh, long after I got out of the Corps. Um, we were put into trucks early Easter Sunday morning, uh, taken down um, to the docks on North Island, and looking around for a ship. We were lost in a sea of big warehouses and things like that, anxious to see where we were going to go and what we were going. And we went around a corner of a building, and there was a, an aircraft carrier. And I, I, we just couldn't believe our good luck that we were going to sail overseas on a carrier. It was the Bonhomme Richard. Um, I'd like to tell you that at this that at that point in time I knew what the Bonhomme Richard was historically, but I didn't. Um, we got on the ship, it took all day to load, and we realized very quickly that we were just passengers. We, nothing would be required us on, on the way over. We were given cots, uh, told to set them up somewhere on the hangar deck, which we did under an F6F slept under that for sick nights, and um, set sail at night in a huge rainstorm, and a, a big storm, a storm so big that when we sailed out into it, it damaged the ship, um, damaged catwalks, and, and, just, and, and damaged some of the, the planes up on the deck. A Couple of days out at sea, and we looked around, and we realized we were all alone. And I think all of us felt, as, as anyone sailing out in wartime on a, on a ship of war, where's our convoy? Because you'd, you'd seen that in, or seen that in the movies, or ships moved in convoys. We were alone. And then reality sets in that the, the, the odds against the Japanese attacking us between San Diego and we knew now we were going to Pearl Harbor were very slim. So we, we just had the, the run of the ship which was a, a great adventuresome thing, and this was part of the, my feeling during almost all the time I was in the Corps that they let me sail on carriers, they let me fly in bombers, they, they let me go out on flight lines, so all these things. I felt as though I was, I, I'm not going to use the word privileged, but I feel that uh, I was part of a, a vast pageantry and a majestic operation that was going on countrywide, and I was part of it. And um, I guess I realized much later that it, it, right now, today, that people who served in World War II are being looked upon as a vanishing breed. We are dying. And people are resurrecting World War II. There are reenactors now for World War II, as there used to be for the American Civil War. And 
I sense that back then, that this is something very special. This is a, a unique thing that if I had missed it, I would feel very bad about that. That's this wee band of brothers again. Do okay. you feel like that other band of brothers felt the same way? Sorry? Do you feel that your brothers in the Marine Corps felt the same way? I don't know. Do you feel that I you were more them. mature than many of them? No, I was callow in 18. <laughs> I really was. So you're on your way to Pearl Harbor. How long were you out at sea for? I don't have notes on it, but I think it was a, about a five or six day trip. Um, we never saw another ship until we were almost in sight of the, uh, the island of Oahu. And we were out on deck. Uh, I had learned to play chess on the way over. Somehow I, I think in a little bag that the Red Cross had given us when we sailed out of San Diego, it had cards and things in it. There was a little tiny chess set in it. So I learned to play chess. And we were out on the deck one afternoon and suddenly there was a huge explosion and all the ship's guns were firing, which was very unusual. And a big, bright yellow B-26 bomber flew right over us, towing a target. And that's what they were shooting at. And this thing made several circles um, over the ship. And all the 40 millimeters and the 20 millimeters were firing at this thing. And then it took off. And we realized that shortly we were inside of land. And this was the southernmost coast of um, the island of Oahu, and we pulled into Pearl Harbor, and it was late afternoon, and um, we were seeing the Aloha Tower on the right. Somehow I knew what that was. Well, it's got Aloha written on it, so that was a, a hint. And then we saw the Franklin was there uh, in Pearl Harbor, and it was sitting there on the other side of Ford Island from us. Um, a burnt out hulk with big gaping holes in it. And uh, I thought I had the mental image of the flight deck looking like shredded wheat. It was uh, broken, the ship was broken. Um, there was nobody on it, there were no planes on it, there was nobody walking on it, no signs of life. And this is the, the, the ship our, our friends had been on. Um, we were um, horrified to see this, uh, a great sense of reality. You read about it in the papers or something like that, but there it is. Um, the remnants of the raid on Pearl Harbor were still there. The, um, I think the Utah and the Oklahoma, the Hulks, were still there. Of course, the Arizona was still there. Um, almost immediately as we docked, there was a, a blackout in, in Hawaii that night. Hawaii was, by the way, uh, this is ancient history. Hawaii was still the territory of Hawaii. It would be 14 years it would, before it would become a state. So in a blackout in Pearl Harbor, my sense of the Franklin being right over there, it, it, it was, um, you couldn't see it, but we knew it was there. We, oh, we all knew it because we talked about it. And then how long were you there for? At Pearl? Mm -hmm. Well, I was... Or in Hawaii itself. Well, we went over to the uh, Marine Air Corps Station at EVA, E-W-A, pronounced EVA, and waiting to be assigned to some kind of a squadron. Um, I was an aerial ordnance man, which meant at this time of the war, uh, you went to, if you went to another organization, a squadron had so many ordnance men, so many cooks, so many pilots. So if a squadron was full, you didn't go there. But if an ordnance man went home or something, they needed a number 911, which is what I was. So uh, we were there. Um, we were there on, on the 12th when we heard that Franklin Roosevelt had died. The 12th of? Of April. Of April, yeah, 1945. Um, we were stunned because that's the only president any of us had ever known, and we stood around wondering who would be the next president. I don't think anybody of 
us came up with the answer of Harry Truman. Um, we felt a great sense of personal loss and a little bit of apprehension. What's going to happen to us now that he's gone? Um, we were aware that Okinawa was, the battle for Okinawa was going on. Um, sailing into Pearl, I might say, that um, a good friend of mine that I met in college who had been at Iwo Jima, we figured out later on that he was sailing out of Pearl Harbor that same day in a, in a hospital ship. Uh, he had been up at Aiea Heights, which is the big hospital north of Pearl Harbor, and um, badly shot up at Iwo Jima. Left on that ship the same day I had arrived. So I'm arriving in the war zone when literally the war is just about over. It, it, would, it would be over within uh, five months. So a squadron um, on the island of Kauai needed a 911. That was me. So I was sent over there um, to be the ordnance man for the squadron. And this was the bright yellow B-26s that we had seen from the carrier, um, a tow target outfit. There was another one on Guam. There was two in the entire Marine Corps, and I was being sent to one as their, their ordnance man. So day to day, what was your what was your day like in Kauai? I think I was sent to probably the most informal outfit in the United States Marine Corps. Um, we were very small. We we had six planes, and we were on a base that um, shared the base. There was a dog leg runway, and the far side of the base was the Army, the Army Air Corps. We had nothing to do with them, nor they, they with us. And, and to answer your question, my job basically was uh, to take care of the, the rifles uh, that this squadron owned. They had, uh, say there were 100 men in this outfit, and that's a lot. Uh, that's, that's what I had to take care of their rifles and in any other ordnance on the base. I think we owned a machine gun that was there for uh, defensive purposes because there had been a bum bunker up at the end of the runway that, and that gun came from there. Beyond that, there wasn't much for me to do and then as soon as I got there, they were looking for somebody to volunteer to be the squadron mailman and I, <laughs> I raised my hand. I wanted to fly. That meant that three times a week I would be sent over to Pearl Harbor or Hickam Field or, or Hawaii or Honolulu to pick up the mail and bring it back to the squadron. Um, any time, almost any time I wanted to, I could fly. If, if they were going up on a, a test flight for something or other, uh, I would volunteer. I would go up at night. I would go up short flights or long flights down to the big island of Hawaii. Um, I was taking off one day in, to, to begin with, a lot of the men were afraid of these planes. Um, they would work on them, but they really weren't too anxious to fly in them. They were a, a very hot airplane. They had very stubby wings, a cigar-shaped fuselage. And when they were being developed, a lot of these things crashed. They had absolutely no ability to, to glide. Um, if you get engine trouble, you, you sank like a stone. And um, when they were being developed out of Tampa, Florida, so many of them crashed into the bay there that it was called Iron Bottom Bay. And then Senator Truman was called down to investigate this new plane, what was wrong. I didn't know that when I joined the squadron. And I enjoyed flying in them. And when, I, when, when they took off, I had to get in the bomb bay. Because to balance the plane so I wouldn't be back in the tail. But immediately upon taking off, you'd crawl back and sit back there in, in my own little world in this glass plexiglass bubble back there with such a, a sense of freedom and again this sense of they're letting me fly. Um, and I loved it until one day we take, took off in one of these things. I think we were flying over to Pearl Harbor and we got up a couple of thousand feet, and I don't know how many miles away from the base, and the left end en engine exploded. 
um, I heard this big bang, and I turned around and all the smoke is pouring back through the bomb bay and I look out on the, on the left wing and it's burning. And I had, you were, you were a headset and I, I heard the pilot calling uh, our base announcing that we're in trouble, emergency, turning back to come to back to the base. And with, with the plane's reputation, I was surprised that he was going to try and fly it back. I thought we're all going to bail out of this thing, get out of it, because it, you can't fly in one engine, theoretically. And to get into my place in the plane, there was a little hatch back there, which I would open up to get in or out of it. And you wear a harness and you wear a chest chute, which makes you kind of fat if you want to get into a small space. And up to that time, I'd always thought, to, if I had to bail out of this thing, this hatch is too small. I couldn't get out. I'd have to take off my chute somehow or put it back on in the air. I never quite figured that out. But in those few minutes, waiting for the pilot to tell me to bail out, I was anxious to get out of that plane. That hatch looked like a barn door. I was, I was ready to sail out and trying to remember all the things we've been taught about what you're supposed to do when you bail out. But the pilot, um, I could hear him calling the tower, saying, we have an emergency, we have an engine on fire. And I remember the tower responding, the fire truck is not here. Can you circle the base a couple of times? <laughs> and I was old enough to realize that was stupid, and the, the pilot didn't talk to them anymore. He, he knew it was stupid, too. Or, or maybe he said, we're coming in on a, a, a head-end approach. Uh, we're not going to circle or anything else. And he did, and he made it. We made it back um, in a very rough landing that um, didn't do much for the landing gear. But we all stood around watching the fire trucks come up, um, blow this gas foam onto the engines. Um, I went back into the plane because I'd forgotten the mail, and I had to bring that out. Um, they never to this day, I think, figured out uh, what had happened, and after about another hour, they warmed up another plane and we took off, but thereafter on, on takeoffs, I was always afraid, um, sitting in the bomb bay, hearing the plane start to pick up speed, hearing the pebbles pick up hitting the bottom of the plane, gathering speed. Not until we were fully airborne did I appreciate flight again, looking down and seeing whales, by the way, in the, in the Kauai Channel. That's what I was going to ask you about. It, it uh, has a reputation nowadays of being such a beautiful island. Um, what was it like there? And what was your weather like on a normal day? The weather was tropical. I think Hawaii averages 72 degrees year-round. Uh, we were adjacent to the Waimea Canyon, which is the wettest spot on Earth, uh, literally, because the trade winds come in off the Pacific, buck up against the mountains, which are a couple of thousand feet high on the uh, back of the Nepali cliffs. It rained a lot back up in the canyons, but it didn't affect us. And we would fly over the canyon which Elizabeth and I have gone back to visit subsequently in a, in a helicopter, we'd look upon it as a place you didn't want to crash in. That's the only attraction it had for us. We, didn't, you, we couldn't get to it. We had no transportation. Um, the only th thing that we were aware of nearby that was worth looking at was the island of Nihau which is, I think, the westernmost of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, it was called the Forbidden Island. It, it is and was uh, privately owned. I would drop mail there, too, um, and was told the story of um, one day one of our squadron planes was coming down fast and low, and a passing Army B-25 saw us and thought we were playing games and followed us down and didn't pull out and crashed. So that B-25 is splattered all over that island. It was still there when I saw it. And on the day Pearl Harbor was bombed, um, a Japanese plane was hit 
uh, one of their fighter bombers. Um, and he glided up over Kauai, over the Nepali cliffs, and as far out as Nihau, uh, where he, he crashed, and with his pistol uh, subjugated the, the natives that were on the island until they uh, overcame him and they beheaded him with their machetes. And his propeller hung up over our operations door um, at the end of our runway. And I've often wondered what, if anybody knows where that came from and, and the history of it. Amazing. What do you feel were some of your greatest challenges while you were in the service? I was never in combat, and um, I, I am very um, aware of how different my career in the Corps was uh, from anybody else's. I guess my greatest challenge was to do my job correctly, that other people's lives, in effect, depended on it. Um, we could screw up something awful if, if we did. Uh, we were pretty well trained. Um, survival for me meant not s walking into a prop or doing something stupid around some pretty dangerous machinery. These, these planes could, they could hurt you. People did get killed by them. Were you able to make close friends when you were stationed in some of these areas? Yes. And did you remain in contact with them? One of them specifically, uh, a guy who was, um, his name was Robert Lynch. He became a sergeant. Um, he joined the, the uh, state police here in Massachusetts. Once when I went back to New Jersey, I got a phone call one night. It was Robert telling me that a place called the Coconut Grove was burning, and he was there. Um, I didn't hear from him for years, and then I, I went, came up to school to go to Boston and found that Bob Lynch had joined the, Marine, uh, the, um, the state police and stationed out here in Framingham. So he and I saw each other several times, and then um, I guess he, he must have put in his 20 years in the, in the state police, because the, then I began looking for him again, and I heard that he joined the Merchant Marine, shipped out, and I never heard from him again. And you mentioned that occasionally you would hear about other areas in war. H how did you normally hear about that? the news of the war or other areas of the Well, we, we war. read uh, Stars and Stripes, I think, as the Army paper. But there was an enormous and, and marvelous and efficient grapevine in the services that something could happen um, at a great distance. And we would hear about it. And we knew where guys were. And um, I guess occasionally letters would be exchanged. but. How we knew our friends were on the Franklin, I can't tell you. But we knew that some other people that we had served with were on Midway or were on some island or had gone out to Kwajalein to work in tanks. Guys that we had left behind in Memphis, a group that didn't come east with us, wound up on Kwajalein uh, doing ordnance on tanks. And where is that? The island of Kwajalein. I guess it's south of the Marianas. During that period of time, did you get any time off, R&R &R, as they call it, or any kind of? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had, uh, we could go into Honolulu when, when we were back on Oahu. Uh, uh, out at Barking Sands with the, with the squadron, there was nothing to do on that island, nothing at all except the, the natural beauty of the place, which I had not yet come to appreciate. Um, but when we were back on Oahu, when, when the war ended, um, if, if I can go back to that, the war ended. Um, our squadron broke up, and it, oddly enough, they, they discovered that on paper, instead of owning six planes, they were supposed to own only four. And this, I guess this was an embarrassment to somebody. So we were told to destroy two airplanes. And one day we were all took fire axes and whatever and went out on the runway and hacked up two airplanes, two big, beautiful B-26 bombers, and carted all the stuff off in the back of the truck to a dump somewhere and 
that aluminum must be still sitting there to this day. I don't know what they did with the engines, but we got rid of the two planes. We went into Honolulu to, to answer your question. Um, if we had any money, and we, we didn't have much, um, I got, I guess we got $21 a month maybe to pay, but for going overseas, you got another 20%, I think, and then if you flew, you got 50%, flight, ha flight hazard pay, they call. So I think I wound up getting like $120 a month, which um, some you sent home and you bought war bonds, things like that. You, you bought stuff that you needed. We, we all smoked. Um, maybe we bought things to send home. Honolulu, we thought of as a, um, a very shady place, and it, it was. It, they, it was filled with people who had come all over, um, ripping off the, sales, the, uh, the sailors, uh, the servicemen. Anybody who went out to the Pacific or came back, most people at least, went through Honolulu and, and the, uh, that island. So these, these guys, these Sharpies, they, Downtown Honolulu would be um, block after block of little shacks people had set up trying to sell something to the servicemen or do engraving or tattoos or whatever just to separate them from their money. Most of the time we'd stay on the base or we'd do a lot of swimming. Do you feel that... Um I know you said you weren't in combat, but do you feel that you were given the right background, the proper equipment, certainly the clothes? Were, was everything adequate for the environment that you were in? Oh, yes. Um, the Marines have a theory that every Marine is, is ready for combat at any time, that when we left uh, Paris Island, we were we were very well trained as riflemen and bayonets and hand-to-hand -hand and stuff like that. Their, their theory is that uh, at any time, at any place, um, our squadron could have defended itself very well because the pilots, the bakers, the cooks, um, the shoeshine guys, whatever, are riflemen, basically. And then whatever they do beyond that is secondary. But I, th I think I said to you before, that they we fired for record is extremely important because you have to be good for the rest of your career in the Corps. And you said that. at the time 340 was a perfect or? Were perfect, and there was always the rumor that some kid somewhere had shot a, a 340. Do you remember what your score was? 301. You remember that? Yes. Even to this day. I remember Elizabeth's name. <laughs> I remember 301. What were some of your most memorable experiences or characters or humorous things that really kind of stick out in your mind? All right, I'll go back to Paris Island for a character um, that in the Marine Corps, I had studied the Marine Corps before I'd gone in and knew, I knew the real and genuine heroes of the Corps and that kind of thing. And one of these was a gunny sergeant named Lou Diamond who in Guadalcanal had... Uh, the world knew of Lou Diamond, or the world of the Marine Corps. Um, he had a reputation with a mortar that he could fire uh, a mortar with such accuracy that he could drop it down the funnels of Japanese destroyers offshore. He could, you know, put it in a 10-foot ring. He was a combat man. He was a, a genuine hero who won um, a series of great medals and one of them, um, they fell out with all fanfare and everything else to give Luke um, a medal. And he showed up in his dungarees, much to the embarrassment of all the officers around in their dress blues. And some general was coming to give him a medal. And they said, why aren't you in your dress blues? And he said, I won the damn thing in my dungarees, and I'm going to take the damn thing in my dungarees. Paris Island, the first night I'm down there, and we were issued all this equipment and laden down with stuff that uh, we had to uh, dress in and our blankets and everything else. 
And we, the last place we went to was called the Mattress Factory, where they gave us a mattress, and we had to carry this mattress. And who's there working in the Mattress Factory but Lou Diamond? And I was, I couldn't believe that the Corps would do this to him, and he was, like every guy there that night, they were working late at night because we came in late, swearing at us and throwing mattresses at us. And I just stared at him and that he should be there and that the Corps should do this to him. And then much later on when I gained some wisdom about the Corps and its workings, I realized that the Marine Corps doesn't have any place to, they have, haven't got an old folks home. They've got boot camps and places that are thought of as soft duty. And that's where they send the, the, the Lou Diamonds and the other gunny sergeants who all they have to do is make sure the silverware in the mess hall is properly aligned. And they all sit around and get drunk most of the time and pass their time waiting for that awful day when they're going to get one final salute and pushed out the front door. That's a memorable character. As, as for a, an incident or, or things I might remember, I was, we were going to go home very shortly. Um, you went by a, a point system in those days. You got a number of points for every month you were in service, every month you were overseas, a couple of other things that went toward this. Uh, you could pick out to the day when you would get to go home. You figured you needed 120 points and it would take you that long to get them. So I knew I was going to be around till June of 46. Um, therefore, I was at Pearl Harbor when they had the big victory parade and flights of planes, hundreds and hundreds of planes going over, ships parading in the harbor, that kind of thing, parades in downtown Honolulu. A again, I felt I was part of a pageantry, so something going on that um, I was I was witness to, but uh, at the same time I was part of it. I was playing both ends against the middle. One morning, just before we went home, um, I was going up to the north end of the island and glanced out into Pearl Harbor, and overnight a great fleet had materialized out of the sea. And it was a strange looking fleet, unlike others that we'd seen there before. And in the middle of it was a bright orange ship. And then I knew that this was the fleet that was going to go out to Bikini to be part of the first atomic tests. They, I think this one was an underwater bomb that blew up under the fleet. But looking out at this and this German ship uh, painted bright orange and all the other ships around it that didn't look like American. It, it wasn't a typical American Navy, Navy scene that you'd seen in Pearl. Watching that and, and looking carefully at it again, I realized that um, it's like being present at the creation of something. You, you are watching Lincoln at Gettysburg, perhaps in that uh, sense. A few weeks later, I was home in Bloomfield. I'd gotten home on June 27th. On July 1st, my mother and I were sitting out on the back porch listening to a little radio. They were announcing this bomb test out of the Bikini Atoll, and they started the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, and they got down to just about one, and a bolt of lightning <laughs> struck a tree in our backyard <laughs> with this tremendous bang, and my mother and I jumped up and then laughed at ourselves. But the juxtaposition of that and the fleet I'd seen, I could visualize it sitting out there, and then you have seen, seen this gigantic tower of water overcoming this. That's memorable. You felt then possibly that you were a part of history oh, in the making. Oh, very much so, yes. What was it like coming home, not only for you but for your family, returning, picking up your life again? Um, my father was away when I got home. He was on another trip to South America. I think he was in, he may have been 
back in Cuba, so he wasn't there. Um, I came home very much aware of the fact that I had things to do. I had a lot to make up. Uh, just before I left uh, the Corps, they called me in and asked me if I wanted to join the uh, Marine Corps rifle team to tour the Pacific. They would have tournaments or whatever all over the islands. And I, and I, I thought, you know, you guys are about a year too late that I, I would love to have done this, but uh, I am now, I guess, 19. Uh, I, I want to go to school and I've got to get home. So I very reluctantly turned that down. It was an offer. Uh, they couldn't order me to do it. When I got home, uh, the, s the first day after I was home, I went back to the high school and found they had summer school going along and it had been in session for quite a while. And they told me if I could make up all the work that I had lost, that I could, in fact, um, do something about that delinquent diploma that my father picked up for me that night. So I, I went to summer school and then finished that, got a few credits, needed a lot more. So for, for the, literally the next year, I, um, I took menial jobs in factories, whatever I could get, and went to night school to make up all the rest of the points I had to get. And during that year, m ran into a guy who had been in the Navy. Um, and he and I decided for no reason that is logical or rational that we were going to join the reserves. He in the Navy and I were in the Marine Corps. This was April of 47. So we got on a bus and went down to Newark, New Jersey and went into the recruiting place and joined the reserves. And the lieutenant said to me, do you want four years or three? And I said, what's the difference? He said, there's no difference. Do you want four years or three? So I said, I'll take three. And he said, why don't you take four? And I said, no, I, no, I want three years. So I signed up for three years, which means I would have gotten out in April of 50, which I did. I served in the reserves for three years. In June of 50, the Korean War broke out. So in another eight weeks, I would have been called back into the Corps if I had taken four. And if I had gone back, I, I've always felt very deep within me that if I had gone back to Korea, I would have been killed. That there too much happened there that was uh, too many places where Marines got into very serious trouble. And I felt I would have been one of them. Once you um, finished with your high school diploma, uh, with your night school, then did you go on to a further education after that? Yeah. Um, my mother heard on the radio that there was um, three colleges opened up by the state of New York specifically for veterans and a smattering of, of non-vets. Um, and they were on former bases, Navy bases, I guess, or uh, Army bases up in New York State. So I, I signed up and I was accepted at um, Plattsburgh, Champlain College at Plattsburgh, New York. And I, I went there for two years. And then from there, I uh, had the opportunity to go either to Syracuse University or Boston University. And um, I went to Boston University and got two degrees from them. What were, were those degrees? In, in journalism. And then did you pursue a journalism career? The rest that? of my life, you know. You did. How important do you feel serving in the military was, and how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? I thought it was extremely important to me for the opportunity of the experiences that I went through there. But I also felt that I was part of a, a, a war that um, I've said this to you before, I know, uh, that possibly was the last just war that I can still rationalize going away and um, b being in a wartime situation for a, a cause that uh, all the history I've read since then has not changed my mind about that. Other things that, other involvements of the American military um, I think I would have been very troubled 
to have uh, had to make a decision to go into it. And I, I think Vietnam specifically, that I would not have gone. And uh, I, I talked about that with my mother once, and she was, um, she couldn't believe that, you know, if you, my country right or wrong, Stephen Decatur, uh, that's the way she felt. I didn't feel that way. So based on those feelings, one of the questions we do ask other uh, people that we have interviewed is how you feel about the business of public opinion regarding the veterans of your generation, World War II, versus those of the Korean conflict and of the Vietnam War. How, how do you feel? How well was I received vis-a-vis -vis those? Or, or why do you feel there was a difference, or do you feel there was a difference of opinion about you and coming back from the war versus those who are in those other wars or conflicts? I feel I was very well received. Um, it was not discussed much in my house. I think there was part of the uh, wisdom of the day that um, might have been accepted in my home as well as others was he doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did want to talk about it, but nobody particularly asked me anything about it. And I was, when I went to night school and later on, especially starting school, I was with a bunch of guys who'd been in it. And they didn't want to talk about it. They, we've done it. And we did our job and we've, we did it well. And it was, if you look at it, the World War II was probably the last national project that the entire American population agreed with and participated in. My mother rolled bandages, housewives, uh, block wardens, that kind of thing, Rosie the Riveter. Everybody was into this. That was not true in Korea. Korea suffered from a, a huge indifference. Um, I feel sorry for guys that went there. Um, it was a terrible fight. A, a terrible place to fight. But the newspapers um, carried stories of Hill 609, Hill 702. That did not resonate well with the American people. And um, This was 50. They'd just gotten rid of World War II. And then Korea was uh, unforgivable, uh, the treatment those, those men received and the the preparation they received. They were on a plane one day and in Vietnam the next day, and when they put in their year, um, they came back to the States with no leave taking or anything like that. And they were asked to do terrible things. The Vietnam veterans. Yes, I think they've been treated very badly. Um, only now is the United States beginning to look at Korea, and I think it's, I think it's still afraid to look at what they did in Vietnam. When you came back, you did mention that you joined the reserves. Have you joined any other veterans organizations? No, I have not. Um, you mentioned that you purchased your first home under the GI Bill. Yes, I did. Um, did you receive other veterans benefits, hospitalization benefits or insurance? No, I got GI insurance, mm -hmm. um, and I certainly got five years of college, which uh, to me is a, the gift of a lifetime. As we close this morning, are there any thoughts or memories or comments that you would like to share with those who may view this tape, whether it be your family, the Natick community, or other members of future generations that might see this tape? I guess I would say that uh, I would ask people to be very watchful of what its government is doing. Um, par participate as fully as possible in the political process, which controls where we send our, our men and women. Um, be careful of what's asked us, of us as a nation, and if you have a point of view on it, make it known, because sometimes I think we get into Somalias or Hades or Grenadas because nobody pays much attention to it. It's not on 
It's not playing at the local theater, and it's, it's those guys in the army now. Well, those guys in the army are us. Yeah, be, ca very, be very watchful and very, very supportive of the guys that do it and the ladies. John, we'd like to thank you this morning for sharing some of your memories with us. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Joan.